Well, thank you, Brother Malcolm, and good evening, brethren and sisters and young people. Well, tonight we're going to do a very quick exercise because we're going to try and cover the whole life of Jacob, but focus in particular on what Hosea 12 tells us about perhaps the most important event in his life, and that is the wrestling with the angel, because that's where we get our title from, Prevailing with God. Now, the good thing about this, of course, is that unlike last evening when we didn't have any friends, when you're giving a study class, there's an expectation that the bulk of the audience are going to have a pretty good knowledge uh, of the story of the life of Jacob. So I'm going to hit the hot spots in the life of this man. We can't pause for too long in any one place, but we are going to try and extract some very important lessons for us all. And the first thing we need to understand is that when the Apostle wrote in Hebrews 11 verse 16 that God was not ashamed to call himself by the name of the patriarchs. In fact, you probably are aware that the word called in Hebrews 11 verse 16 should be rendered surname. He was not ashamed to surname himself after the patriarchs and to be their God. Well, of course, that's a reference to the surname he gave himself in Exodus 3 verses 14 and 15. Now, the name Yahweh, of course, is his name. It means he who will become but his surname was the God of, of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So it's a rather long surname, isn't it? But there's a reason why God gave himself that surname. Because, you see, it sets the pattern for the way in which he would produce his family. The other question you need to ask yourself is, why did he wait until Exodus 3 to give himself this surname? Why did he wait until that time to reveal his name anyway? Well, because, you see, he was waiting until he had a family, and that family was now in Egypt. You remember in Genesis 22 when he sent Abraham on a mission to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah, that Abraham was representing Yahweh in that transaction, and Isaac was, of course, a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the way it is. Abraham had, his, had Yahweh's fatherhood delegated to him Isaac, the son, is clearly a type of Christ in the scripture. So Jacob represents the multitudinous seed, the family of God. And that's why he gave himself that surname, because here is a father who through a son will produce a multitudinous seed. And we're part of that, aren't we? But what that tells us is something quite important to us. It tells us this, that Jacob is going to be the prototype the experiences that he went through are going to be the prototype for all who will be part of that multitudinous seed in the kingdom age. And so when we look at the life of Jacob, we're really looking at the process which Yahweh uses to bring his children into the kingdom. It's not a terribly comfortable process at times because Jacob went through some pretty awful experiences. It's quite often quite painful, to be sure, but it's part of the process by which we will attain the kingdom. It's just a, a simple but interesting fact that that surname occurs 12 times in Scripture and 12, of course, is the number of Israel. And this is how God is developing what we call the Israel of God, of which we are very, very privileged to be part. I want to start tonight in the life of Jacob at the birth of Jacob and Esau in Genesis 25. In Genesis 25, from verse 19, we have the generations of Isaac and, of course, the problem that for 20 years after their marriage, no children were born. And so they took the matter to Yahweh and they asked him. Isaac, verse 21, entreated Yahweh for his wife because she was barren. And God answers their prayers and then we find that Rebekah runs into a problem because, you see, she has twins in her womb, but they're very diverse twins. And we know, of course, because when they were born, they were quite diverse, that they represent flesh and spirit, Edom, allied to Adam, Adam was a man of the flesh, while Jacob was an upright man. We read a little later on, he was a man of the spirit. So you had flesh and spirit in the womb of Rebekah, and they were not getting on very well at all. And there's a parable, there's a lesson to be learnt from this, because there's no question when you look at Genesis 24, that when Abraham sent his servant to get a wife for Isaac, that that's a type of, of the apostles going out to find the bride of Christ. And, of course, they bring back Rebekah and he takes, Isaac takes her into his mother Sarah's tent. Our mother is Zion, represented in the allegory of Galatians 4 by Sarah. 
representing the Abrahamic promises. So he takes his bride into his mother, Sarah's tent. So she is clearly a type of the bride of Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, there's an important lesson here. Because you see, the bride of Christ will have a struggle. There's an internal struggle between flesh and spirit. Every member of it will have that struggle. Now this phrase here that's used in verse 22, and the children struggled together, is no, no ordinary word. It is the word ratsats. It means to crack in pieces. Get a bit of a feel? This is sort of not something that's very comfortable. So here you've got these two babies as they're growing in the womb who are fighting to stay apart. You know, they're not cuddling up to each other and saying, oh, I love you, Esau, or I love you, Jacob. They're saying, get away from me. I don't want anything. Get away. Pushing and shoving. And so this woman can't get any sleep. Day or night, she's got, you know, you've had a, if you've had a baby in your womb, sisters, you know what it's like. You know, it's not always, uh, you know, still, is it? And there's elbows being, I've actually had elbow of my, one of my children hit me in the bed at night because I was up close to my wife. Bang! So you can imagine if you've got two babies and they're fighting to stay apart in her womb. She gets absolutely no rest. And this is what happens. She takes the matter to Yahweh. Look at the end of verse 22. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of Yahweh. If it is right, why is it like this? You know, we sometimes ask that, don't we? Because when the truth comes into our life, it sets up a tension between flesh and spirit. It starts a struggle between those two elements, doesn't it? That's how it's got to be. And there is this struggle between flesh and spirit that will go on until the day of our birth, our spiritual birth, brothers and sisters. We're not going to be released from that struggle until there is a birth of the spirit. And that's what happens here. She doesn't get any relief. She asks the question, could this be a blessing of Yahweh? Would the blessing of God come in this way? Well, yes, it did in my life because when the truth came into my life, it started that struggle. And it's been intense and sometimes been quite painful just like your experience. And it will go on like that until Christ comes and we get a change of nature. That's the way it's got to be for every member of the bride of Christ. And so the answer comes in verse 23. And Yahweh said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Now this, this of course, is telling us that there is diversity in her womb. You've got Esau, who's about to be born as the firstborn, representing the flesh. You've got Israel representing the spirit. But notice what it says here in verse 23. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So which is the oldest in you, flesh or spirit? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Flesh is the older. So Edom is the firstborn. And she is told that eventually, through this struggle the elder will serve the younger. She is told that the spirit is actually stronger than the flesh. That's true, brothers and sisters, it is. And ultimately, the spirit will prevail. And so we have this remarkable parable, and of course the birth comes uh, in verse 24. So that's how the, the, the story of Jacob and Esau begins. Just before we go on to verse 24, however, just step back to verse 20 of Genesis 25. Because when we read there, we read something that is important to note. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister to Laban the Syrian. Why do you need to be told that Laban is a Syrian if his father is Bethuel the Syrian? It's overkill. It's deliberate though. The scripture doesn't waste any words. It wants to make a point. Now this, this word here, Syrian, as you can see on the screen, Aramee means an Aramite or an Aramean. And it's, of course, someone from that area to the east, to the northeast of Israel. But in Hebrew, Syria and Edom are very similar. And you can see the, the consonants of these, of these two names here. See the consonants here? There's only one little difference. And that difference is in this middle consonant. There's a little, little tittle on one of those consonants. And copyists have a great difficulty at times picking this up. And a mistake has been made. Because if you go to 2 Samuel 8, which we're not going to do now, but if you jot down 2 Samuel 8, verses 12 to 13, you will find that the record actually talks about 
the Syrians, when the companion account in 1 Chronicles 18 verses 11 and 12 tells us it was actually the Edomites. Joab destroyed, remember, the Edomites in the Valley of Salt. Well, somewhere along the line, the copyists didn't put that little tickle in there. So the question is, why, do they, why are these two words, Edom and Syria, so close together? Why so similar? I think, I think there is an intentional semantic identification of Syria with Edom. Why? Well, because you see, the problem that's going to dog the steps of Jacob for the next, you know, 100 years is the problem of the Syrian. He is going to be even acting like a Syrian in Genesis 27, as we're going to see. And for once, Rebecca, his mother, acts like a Syrian when she advises him to tell lies. This is going to dog his steps. And if I had time, I could show you how this works through the life of Jacob. And that even when God changes his name to Israel in Genesis 32, he does not call him Israel in the record until Genesis 35, when two Syrians die, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, and Rachel, his wife because she truly was a Syrian. She had her father's um, teraphim in her possession and she was like Laban, so much like Laban, as we're going to see, he didn't even suspect her of taking the teraphim. So the problem of the Syrian is going to dog Jacob's steps all his days. But there's another problem which identifies him with, with Edom and that's in verse 24 of Genesis 25. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb and the first came out red all over like a hairy gun. When was the last time you saw a baby covered in hair, leave alone red hair? Doesn't happen, doesn't it? This, this boy is almost mature from birth. He looks like an animal. He's born like a deer. All right? he, he, he's like an animal. He's mature from birth and he never ever changes from the way he was at birth. Even though he had the same upbringing, the same parents, the same Sunday school, the same ecclesia, the same education as Jacob, he never ever changed from the way he was born. But Jacob has a problem too. Look at verse 26. And after that came his brother out and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob, heel catcher. Now, when I was born, brothers and sisters, I was born with my hand on Esau's heel, just like Jacob. You know the connection between... This is interesting, isn't it? Genesis 3.15. The connection between the seed of the woman and the serpent happens to be a heel. You know, the heel coming down on the head of the serpent. So here is the connection that Jacob has with, with Esau. When Esau is being born, he's being pulled out of the womb, Jacob has got his hand hanging onto Esau's heel. And that hand on Esau's heel... God has to spend the next 147 years trying to release his grip off Esau's heel. He's doing the same in my life. He's doing the same in your life. I was born with a problem. My problem was my connection with Adam. Jacob's problem was his connection with Edom. Adam, the root of Adam. Right? That's our problem, isn't it? Our connection with Adam. And God is going to spend the rest of his days trying to release him from that connection. That's what the truth's about. That's how it ought to work in our life. But of course, it's a bumpy road. I want you to come to Genesis 27. We're going to very, very quickly summarise the content of Genesis 27. Because the time when Isaac thinks he's going to die, in fact he lives another 63 years, so he had a few years to go. But he thinks he's going to die, he's, he's dim of eye, and so he, he, he suggests that he's going to give a blessing to Esau the firstborn. And Rebecca, of course, picks up on this and she says to Jacob, we've got to do something about this because you're the rightful firstborn. You know that, that Isaac and Rebecca, who were a wonderful couple, both very faithful, had spent 57 years where they had one thing in which they bitterly disagreed. It was one of those things you didn't talk about. It's a no-talking situation in their married life. They did not talk about the status, the spiritual status of Esau and Jacob because... Isaac loved Esau because of his abilities, his, his hunting, the venison that he enjoyed, all things that human beings normally take pride in, by the way. And Rebekah loved Jacob because he was a plain, ordinary man who was a shepherd. He wasn't a killer like his brother. And he was, simply, he was a simple, truthful man, like Christadelphians ought to be. Okay? So, 
Now, there was an argument about this because Rebekah said he's the rightful firstborn. Isaac said, no, I'm going to bless Esau. Well, what happens? A mother does something here that mothers should never do. For once in her life, the Syrian emerges. She's now going to operate like her brother Laban. She tells her son that he should tell lies. Now, no mother, no Christadelphian mother should ever tell her children to tell lies. Christadelphians don't tell lies. Christadelphians tell the truth. But she says to Jacob, we're going to deceive your father. Now, he doesn't enjoy this because, you see, he says in verse 11 of Genesis 27, he said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, he saw my brother as a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. My father, Peraventure, will fill me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver. I've never deceived my father in the past. I don't want to start now. She says, you, you hearken to my voice. Look at the words of verse 13. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, and it was, my son, only obey my voice. So three times in this chapter she makes that statement. She's made it in verse 8. Verse 8 she said, Now therefore my son, obey my voice. She repeats it in verse 13 and she repeats it again in verse 43. Now therefore my son, obey my voice. The problem is that the voice that she was using on this occasion was the voice of the Syrian. And Jacob should have said to his mum, Look mum, you taught me to tell the truth, like all good Christadelphians should. I ain't going to start telling lies now. But because he did obey the voice of his mother, you know what God does to Jacob? He says, right, you have listened to the voice of the Syrian, which is coming for once from your mother. It's a very unusual thing, but it's coming from your mother. I am going to send you and you're going to spend 40 years in the company of her brother. And he talks like that all the time. He's the real Syrian. And he's going to deceive you uphill and down dale until you learn to tell the truth, Jacob. And when you've learned to tell the truth and when you hate what you see in Laban, then you can come home. That's what's going to happen to this man. And that's precisely, of course, what we're going to be considering tonight. We're going to consider him coming home after God releases him. There are six deceptions in Genesis 27. There's clothing in verse 15. So Jacob ends up wearing the garments of the unworthy firstborn. There is the skin, you know, the deceptive skin of the animal uh, of verse 16. Now he had Esau's skin. He was hairy like his brother. There's the savoury meat of verse 17. So he brought Esau's works into his father Isaac. And then you have the problem of the hands. You come down and have a look at verses 22 and 23. Verse 22 says, And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him, and he said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Now you know the nexus between heart and works, don't you? The Lord Jesus Christ said in Luke 6.45, Out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know, so you can't really conceal. You've got the right sort of heart, like Jacob had a truthful heart. You can't conceal that. It's going to come out, isn't it? The problem was that he had Esau's hands. All right? Jacob's voice, but Esau's hands. Just so happens that this word hands occurs six times in these verses. And six is the number, of course, of man. And there are six deceptions here. So this is not something that should ever have happened. Now, I know some people say, oh, but, but Rebecca's motive was good. Well, it might have been, but the, but the method was wrong. If you have a wrong method, it doesn't matter how good your motive is. God does not work by wrong methods. The motive might have been good, but it wasn't the right way. And you know, the blessing that they stole was not the one that Jacob was after anyway. You're going to see that. And in fact, he gave it away. In Genesis 32, 33, when he's preparing to meet Esau, he gives away what he stole. He says to his servants, you go and tell my Lord Esau. And he keeps on talking about my Lord Esau. When he gets to Esau, he bows before him. But the stolen blessing said, you will be Esau's Lord and he will bow before you. It didn't happen that way. It happened the other way because Jacob gave it back. He did not want the stolen blessing. It was not the one that he really was seeking. As we're going to see when we come to it. It wasn't the blessing of faith that Paul talks about in Hebrews 11 and verse 20. So we've got a man here operating out of character. Now no one in this hall ever operates out of character, do they? We wouldn't be like that. Well, of course, we're all like that. There are times when we operate out of character. And here he is. 
And there are always consequences, of course, when you do that. Verse 19 is his deceit. He spoke with Esau's deceitful tongue. Verse 20 is his hypocrisy. He adopted Esau's hypocrisy. And verse 24, he tells a plain blank lie. I am Esau, thy son. It's a lie. And so he stole the blessing. So let's have a look at this stolen blessing in verses 27 to 29 of Genesis 27. And he came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his raiment and said, and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is the smell of a field which Yahweh hath blessed. You get a clue. This blessing's got nothing to do about things that belong to heaven. This is about the blessings of the field. Isaac knew that Esau was not interested in spiritual things. So when he passed on the blessing to Esau, it wasn't going to have very much content about spiritual things, was it? It was going to be to do with the field. He says, when, he, when Jacob comes in dressed in Esau's clothes, oh, smell that! Look at the field! I can smell the field! It's all about the present. It's all about now. So look at the, look at the content of the blessing that is stolen in verse 28. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Did Jacob want that? Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Did Jacob want that? No. Be Lord over thy brethren. Did Jacob want that? No. And let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. That's about the only thing you can ally with the Abrahamic promise in this entire blessing. It, it, it is not a blessing that relates to the things that Jacob loved and that he really wanted. Do you want authority in today's world? Anyone here? Do you want your brethren to come and bow down before you and exercise authority over them? Of course you don't. What do you want? You want life in the kingdom of God, don't you? Yeah, that's not mentioned here. All right, this is not the blessing that they really wanted. They messed it up. They should have just left it to God. Motivation might have been good, method wrong. Took it out of God's hands. Don't ever do that. Leave it in God's hands. That's the lesson that we learn from that. You know, of course, the, the blessing related to the firstborn. There was inheritance, there was authority, there was priesthood. But these are not the things that Jacob was looking for. Now, in fact, three deceivers, there are three deceivers in this chapter and they all suffer. And the one who's deceived, Isaac, is the only one that benefits. Isn't that amazing? It's the way it works, isn't it? The price of deception. Rebecca nearly lost both sons. Verse 45. She had to send Jacob away and never saw him again. She was left to endure Esau and his horrible wives for the rest of her days. Probably put her into an early grave. So she was cursed for telling her son to tell lies. Jacob was blessed but separated from his family. He was forced into the company of an inveterate deceiver for the next 40 years and never saw his mother again. He got to wait till the resurrection. So he's cursed, isn't he? Esau failed to obtain the blessing. He's driven away from, the, from his family and from his roots. Now, have a look at Genesis 27 verse uh, 38. Last sentence. Maybe the whole thing. Verse 38. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. This is the he-man. You know, this is the man that can jump tall buildings, pull out his bow and arrow and shoot deer. And he's boo-hooing like a child before his father. But it doesn't get him anywhere. It does not get him anywhere. Because you see, Isaac has had his eyes opened. He might have had dim eyes in verse 1. But his eyes are wide open now. He can see straight through this fellow. And so what's coming is what really he should have told Esau a long time ago. And what's coming is verse 39. Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. In fact, that's not a good translation. It should be, as the RSV has it, away from the fatness of the earth. Because he ends up in Edom. It's a dry and barren land, away from the fatness of the earth and of the Jew of heaven. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shall serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass that when thou shalt have the dominion, thou shalt break his yoke, yoke from off thy neck. Can I just paraphrase what Isaac's saying to his eldest son? He's saying, listen boy, I've had my eyes opened by this experience. Now I can see straight through you. 
I have been arguing with my wife for 57 years about who should be the true firstborn. Now I know who is. It's your brother Jacob. You don't like, you don't love the truth, do you? You don't want the truth in your life. You're a man of the field. You're a man of the world. So get out there. Now that's what you want. You're 57 years of age. Get out there. That's what he's telling him. Away from the fatness of the earth. There does come a time when you've got to call a spade a spade. And Isaac's doing that. And you know, when Paul picks this up in Hebrews 11:20, he says that Isaac blessed both Jacob and Esau by faith. That can't refer to verses 27 to 29. To have a blessing, blessing stolen, that can't be given by faith, can it? But this one is, and the one that follows in Genesis 28, when he sends Jacob away, is the blessing by faith. So this, this is, a, is a story where you've got three deceivers who suffer and Isaac, who had been deceived, is corrected to act in faith. That's how God works, isn't it? And so off he goes. He's 40 years with Laban. And look, I know, brothers and sisters, that people debate this issue, whether it was 20 or 40. I can give you three indubitable proofs that it was 40 years in Haran. I haven't got time to do that now, but later on, if you want to see me, I'll show you those proofs. Beyond all dispute, it was 40 years in Haran. Now, you work it out this way. In Genesis chapter 31, there are two verses that tell us the timings of his time uh, in Haran. Verse 38 talks about this 20 years. It refers to the time spent as a friend or a son-in-law when he wasn't actually earning any wages after serving 14 years for his two wives. And verse 41, he refers to 20 years in my house, that is, as a servant labouring for wages. So there are two distinct periods of 20 years. That's, that second bracket includes, of course, the seven years he worked for Rachel, the seven years he worked for Leah, and then he sojourns as, as a friend or a son-in-law for 20 years, and then, of course, he serves six years for the cattle in which his wages are changed ten times. Yeah, ten times in six years his wages are changed. Uh, by the dis, this deceiver, Laban. So he's going to spend 40 years, a probation period, in the house of this inveterate deceiver. Once you come to Genesis 28, you see I said to you, we're going to skip, the, you know, we're going to just hit the hot spots here. Now in Genesis 28, we're not going to talk too much about his dreams uh, there at Bethel. You're all familiar with that. We're not even going to relate it to 1 Timothy 3. 15 and 16, where Paul tells us that what happened in Bethel is actually all about the foundations of the ecclesia. You know, he talks about the ecclesia as the pillar and ground of the truth. Well, you know, the stone that he used as his pillow in the morning, after he seen the, the dream of the angels ascending and descending, he props it up and pours oil upon it. It becomes a pillar. Yes, he says. He names the place Bethel, the house of God. So the ecclesia is the house of God. It is the pillar of and ground of the truth. And Brother Thomas points out that the word, word ground there is hedrioma in the Greek and it means a habitation of gods. Yeah, there was. The ecclesia is a habitation of Elohim, isn't it? A habitation of mighty ones. So that's a wonderful story in its own right, but it's not going to help us much. The verse I want is a little bit further down. It's down here after the Abrahamic promises are delivered to Jacob personally at Bethel after he's seen the angels ascending and descending after the Abrahamic promises are passed to him personally, a vital promise is made in verse 15. So what does verse 15 say? This is Yahweh speaking. And behold, he says, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So what's he spoken to him about in verses 13 and 14? Well, he's passed on the Abrahamic promises. He's telling Jacob, I'm going to get you into the kingdom, Jacob. All right? My ultimate objective is to get you into the kingdom and I will never leave you until I've got you there. Now, that's a pretty good promise, isn't it? It's a promise that's repeated throughout the Old Testament, by the way. You know, when we read in Deuteronomy 31, he will not fail the Israel nor forsake thee. Joshua 1.5 personal promise to Joshua. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And so it goes on like that. God makes that promise over and over again to his servants. And it is made 
to us. Because in Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6 we have, this is the International Standard Version translating Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. It says this, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. That's the promise that's made to Jacob, isn't it? I will never leave you or abandon you. Hence we can confidently say, says Paul, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? We're going to see what Laban did to Jacob. This is what men can do to you. But if you believe the promise, you can come through it. If you don't believe the promise, you'll suffer pain. Guess what happens to Jacob? He doesn't believe the promise. So he has to suffer pain. Let's have a look at Genesis 29. Because you see, this promise at Bethel is tested. Tested very quickly. Because when he arrives at Haran, you know the story, he meets Rachel. She's keeping her father's sheep. He pulls away the stone you know, from the lazy Syrians who, who wouldn't do it until they were all there. And he, he waters her father's sheep and he falls in love with this girl. He's head over heels in love with Rachel. She's a pretty girl. And he's determined he's going to marry this girl. But you know, he's going to make Isaac his father's mistake. He's going to do what Isaac did. Because Laban has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. And Leah is the spiritual girl and Rachel is the Syrian in the family of Laban. And Jacob makes the same mistake. He prefers the beautiful above the spiritual. Now, none of us here would ever do that, would we? We wouldn't be so stupid as to do that. Well, of course not. That mistake's been made a million times, hasn't it? A million times. So Rachel was attractive, she was energetic, she was captivating, but she was not deeply spiritual. She was, if you had to put her in a class, she's an Esau type. And you might say, hang on, that's not what I understand about Rachel. I can take you three passages in the Bible which illustrate that that's exactly what God says about her and he uses Rachel as a type of natural Israel. Let me just give you one. Matthew chapter 2. You don't need to go there, you know the story. When Herod sends off his men to kill all the babies under two years of age, remember in Bethlehem, what's the scripture that's quoted? Rachel weeping for her children because they're not... That comes from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. It's a direct quotation. That is telling us something. As does Micah chapter 4. Because Rachel is used in those three passages as a type of natural Israel. Okay. It's Leah that's the type of spiritual Israel. Leah was plain. That doesn't mean she was ugly. She was just plain. Most of us are just ordinary, aren't we? Look in the mirror. We're just ordinary. But she was spiritually inclined and faithful. She was a Jacob type. He was a plain man. Simple. You know, just an ordinary plain man, but honest. That's what Leah was like. And we know what happens here because, and we come back, I just want you to take you, take you to Genesis 29. I'm going to be very quick. Look at verse 21. We know, of course, that he offers to serve seven years for Rachel and they seem like to him as a passing day. You know, it's just gone. He's so much in love with this woman. Then in verse 21, Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. He's in too much of a hurry. Because you see, Laban's got a plan. He's worked all this out. He plies Jacob, doubtless, with a little bit too much, uh, you know, strong drink. So his senses are not quite as sharp as they might have been. And he goes into the room and he's got Leah and he hasn't got Rachel. In the morning he wakes up and says, Who are you? You're not Rachel. You know, he doesn't stop to say, well, look, uh, maybe, maybe the promise is right. The promise of Genesis 28, 15, that I'll never leave you nor forsake you until I've done that which I've spoken to you of. Maybe God's at work here through the deception of Laban. Hadn't Jacob deceived his own father is he not now receiving poetic justice? He's been deceived. But would God allow that to happen if it was not God's will that Leah be his wife? Of course not. 
So Leah was his God-given wife. He just refused to accept it. He refused to believe the promise. And he goes out, he's in a rage, and he races up to Laban and says, What have you done to me? You have strangled a man. He should have just taken a quiet moment to reflect upon what had happened seven years previously at Bethel, to remember the promise. Now, hands up anyone here that wouldn't act like that in these circumstances. Well, there wouldn't be too many hands going up, would there? Because we're all human. And we're all slow to learn, aren't we? Well, that's the lesson. We've got to learn this lesson from Jacob's life because we're all going through the same kind of program. This is how God works to get the Jacob out of all of us. All right? We go through these sorts of circumstances in ecclesial life, in family life. It's not willy-nilly. It's designed to get the Jacob out of us. You see, Jacob means a heel catcher. That's his problem. He's attached to Esau, to Adam. And God's trying to take his hand off Esau's heel. So very quickly, along to chapter 31. He spends his 40 years there. The last six of them, his wages are changed ten times because, you know, you know the story of how he says, well, look, I won't take any wages. I'll just take the, the brown, the speckled, the spotted, any coloured animals in your flock of mine, Laban. You know what Laban does immediately? He gets his sons to take all the coloured animals away, three days' journey. So Laban doesn't give you even a head start. He takes all the coloured animals and, and puts them away. You have a look at Genesis chapter 30, verse 35. And he... The he there is Laban. And Laban removed that day the he goats that were ring straked and spotted and all the she goats that were speckled and spotted and every one that had some white in it and all the brown among the sheep and gave them into the hand of his sons and he set three days journey. So there couldn't be any contact with what Jacob was left to look after. What Jacob was left to look after was all white. There was not a speckled or spotted amongst them. So how's he going to get anything out of that? All right, except through throwbacks. Well, he's got a plan. You know, this is one of the problems we've got to, we've got to learn about Jay. He's got a plan. He can handle this. So he takes down, cuts off branches of trees and he gets out a pen knife and he cuts around and he makes these ring straight branches and he puts them down the cross. When the animals come, expecting that that in some way is going to produce ring straight and spotted, and speckled. Well, Assyrians might have thought it would happen, but we know that nothing happened as a result of him putting down his, his rods. And in the end, you know what happened? It's a, it's a magnificent story. I want to just go through here, Genesis 31, and we'll step back and see what happened, because we're actually told what happened here in Genesis 31. In the first couple of verses, Jacob recognises that Laban and his sons have turned against him. It's time to go. And so, verse 3, Yahweh says to Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. You've heard those words before, haven't you? That's Genesis 28, verse 15. I will be with thee. Have a look at verse 5. When Jacob says to Rachel and Leah out in the field, he says, Your father's countenance is not toward me as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. See, now he's recognising that Genesis 28 verse 15 has been fulfilled in the circumstances that have occurred. Have a look at verse 7. Your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God suffered him not to hurt me. And have a look at verse 9. Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. So this man has come to the realisation that his own machinations, his own you know, attempts to, to reverse Laban's deceptions were useless. So has he put out his rods? He said, oh, this might work. You know, gonna... Well, it didn't work. Because what happened was this, that if Laban specified that Jacob could have one of the brown spotted ring strake that breeding season, and there are two breeding seasons in a year, so there are six years, 12 breeding seasons. That breeding season, they all brought forth that one colour. The next one, Laban comes along and he says, well, <coughs> now, 
I said ring straight last time, now you can have the brown. So Jacob puts out his rods. This time, they're all brown. Laban says, <coughs> okay, I'll change it again. Now you're going to have the whatever. Next time, they're all that colour. In the end, Jacob gets hold of these rods and says, get rid of that rubbish. It's God. It's God who's taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. And God says to him, right, now you can go home. Now you can go home. Eh? That's how it works, brethren and sisters. When he finally comes to the realisation that his own, his own ability to save himself is useless. It's God alone that can do that. He's allowed to go home. He's released from the hands of the inveterate deceiver. I am the God of Bethel, we read in verse 13, where thou anointest a pillar and where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee from this land and return to the land of thy kindred. He has one final struggle, though, with Laban the Syrian. It's in Genesis 31, 17 to 42. Rachel has taken her father's teraphim. They have a few days uh, on Laban, but he catches up with them in Gilead, Gilead, doesn't he? Yeah, Jabesh Gilead. He catches up with them and so he searches through, he abuses Jacob, by the way, and had not God intervened, Jacob would have been killed. There's no question about that. God intervenes to save him from death, but Laban abuses him. He belittles him. So he's caught, interrogated by an angry and suspicious Laban, belittled in verse 30 when, when Laban says to him, And now, though thou wouldest needs be gone, because thou saw longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my gods, my teraphim? You know, the teraphim were not necessarily idols or gods. They could be used for that. But the teraphim were actually the title deeds to your property. Now, that's why Rachel wanted them. She wanted, because she said to Jacob in chapter 30, our father's taken all that belonged to us. We've got nothing. He's ripped it out of our hands. So when she goes, he says, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the title deeds to his property. Hmm. Might come in useful one day. All right. So that's what they represent. And so, of course, he searches. And if you have a look at verse 33, this is a fascinating verse. It says in verse 33 of Genesis 31, And Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the two maidservants' tent, but he found them not. So he searches Jacob's tent. He searches Leah's tent. Then he goes into the two maidservants' tent. So where does he go next? Well, read the next part of that verse. It says this, Then went he out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. He went back to Leah's tent the second time. He had done an absolutely thorough search of Jacob's tent, didn't find him. He went into Leah's tent, he went into maidservant's tent, he went back into Leah's tent. And then when he, when he came into Rachel's tent, he did a very poor job. He did a perfunctory search. Because she, sitting on the saddle, said, Oh, Dad, I can't get up. The manner of women's upon me. I would have kicked her in the backside if she was my daughter and said, Get up, I know you're hiding the thing under there. You know, it was so palpably obvious that that's where the, the teraphim were. But he's a dronga. He doesn't understand. Oh, I'm sorry, that, that word's an Australian word. You don't understand drongo. But it means an idiot. He's an idiot. All right? You know what this is teaching us, brothers and sisters and young people? It's very important. People like Laban never recognise people that are like themselves. It's like the mafia. They think they're all virtuous. I mean, he thinks the, sh the sun shines out of Rachel, yet she is the, she's the very manifestation of his character. All right? He doesn't see that in her. He doesn't see problems in himself, and he doesn't see problems in her. He sees problems in righteous people. He thinks Jacob is a, th is a thief and a liar. He sees problems with Leah. He thinks she's a thief and a liar. He doesn't see that in Rachel. Now, isn't that so typical of human nature? It cannot recognise in, in others its own problem, but it will pick on those that are upright and true. 
So that's the story of Laban. Of course, he goes his way. End of verse uh, verse, uh, 55 of chapter 31, he rises in the morning and Laban departed and returned unto his place. Yes, his place was Syria. That's where he belonged. But Jacob does something else, verse 1 of chapter 32. He went on his way and at last, after 40 years' absence, he meets the angels that he saw at Bethel in Genesis 28. He hadn't seen them for 40 years. They've never left him. They've been ascending and descending upon him. They've been there to manipulate events, you know, but he hadn't been able to see them. Now he sees them again. But he makes a mistake. Look, look what he does in verse 2. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Mahanaim means two camps. No, no, no. Sorry, Jacob. You haven't got two camps. You've only got one. You've only got one camp. Didn't I show you back in Genesis 28 the angels of God ascending and descending upon you? They're in your camp. There's not two camps here, but one. Are you always conscious of the angel? In the case of a family, the angels that have been sent to overshadow your life? Are you always conscious? No, you're like me. All too often you think you've got two camps. The angels camp and our camp, true? No, no, no. We only got one camp. The angels of God ascending, descending upon us. Then he makes another mistake. He actually ends up with three camps. You ever look down at Genesis 32, when the messengers come back in verse 6, they say, oh, Esau's coming with 400 men. Why would he want to bring 400 men to meet his brother unless he's got evil designs? He's going to come up with the 400 men to kill Jacob and his family. Well, why would he want to assume that? You're you're talking about a pea brain man here, aren't you? Esau, he's a pea brain. When he hears the news that Jacob's coming back, he's got four wives and literally thousands of animals and all these servants, Esau's little brain says, well, I can't go up and meet my brother by myself because he thinks I've not done very well for myself. So I'm going to go up there and drive up there with my 400 men and say, well, I've done pretty well too, you know. I've done very well, Jacob. That's human nature, isn't it? He didn't have any evil designs on Jacob. He'd forgotten all that. He just wanted to show off. And Jacob thinks he's coming to kill him. What about the promise? I will not leave thee nor forsake thee until I've done that. If I've spoken to thee all, you're not going to be killed, Jacob. God is going to rescue you from Esau as he rescued you from Laban. But, you know, being a human being, having his hand still on Esau's heel... He goes about, he's running around like a bee in a bottle. He sends off five droves saying, you, when you get to Esau, tell him this and give him this present. He doesn't get a wink of sleep the whole night. If you read this chapter carefully, it's all the one night. Verse 13, he lodged there that same night. Verse 21, he sends off all of these herds with the, with the servants. So went the present over before him and himself lodged that night in the company. Verse 22, and he rose up that night and took his two wives and he puts his whole family over the Jabbok. So there's the Jabbok. He hasn't got a wink of sleep. Because you see, he's trying to manage his own salvation. Jacob is a man who acts and then prays. He does that, he does pray. He does that, of course, in verses 9 to 12 of this chapter. But he acts first and then prays. Not the right order. You need to pray and then act. He's got it the wrong way around. And you see, Jabbok means, as you can see here, it means pouring out or emptying. It's all about emptying the spirit of self-reliance out of Jacob. Emptying the Syrian out of him. That's what it's about. So what happens here is a very important event, isn't it? And we're going to conclude on this little thing here, on on the wrestling with the angel. So what we've done thus far has all been designed to bring us to this point. And you're all familiar with the story. Have a look what happens when he's put his family over the brook Jabbok in verse 23. Now why would he do that, do you think? Brethren, you are very fearful 
of your brother coming with 400 men but you put all your family over the brook and you stay behind. Doesn't sound very courageous, does it? Well, you know, he's desperate. He's trying to find at least one of the angels that he saw in verse 1 of this chapter. He's finally come to the realisation that after a night of choreographing his own salvation, it is not going to work unless Yahweh saves him from the hand of his brother. He's trying to find one of those angels. That's why he stays behind. And of course, that's exactly what happens in verse 24. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. What a verse that is. You know, when we're left alone, I don't know about you, but when I'm left alone, that's when my relationship with God is tested the most. I can behave myself when, when I'm in your company. When I have my lovely wife with me, I, I behave myself perfectly. Well, not perfectly, but you know what I mean. <laughs> when I'm alone, that's when my relationship with God is tested. That's when the question whether or not that angel is there with me is tested. That's when my faith's tested. How about you? So this is an important lesson for us all. And there wrestled a man with him. Now read the words carefully. It does not say that Jacob wrestled with the angel. It says there wrestled a man with him. And there are two things. You've got to get straight about that. Now, some have argued, well, this was probably a man, because it says a man. Well, come on, please, let the Bible speak for itself. I've even heard it was Esau himself. Yet I just shake my head in wonderment. Hosea 12 verse 4 tells us it was an angel. Isn't that good enough? Hosea 12 4 says it was an angel. And it was an angel. So why describe him as a man? here in Genesis 32. So we've got to work that one out. And why does it say that the angel wrestled with him? It wasn't Jacob who started this wrestling. It was the angel who started it. Well, there are two very important points here. The first one is this. It was God who initiated this struggle, just like he initiated the struggle that's going on in you. Who started the struggle that's going on in me? Who started the struggle that went on in Rebecca? Well, it was God, wasn't it? It's God who started that, not us. When he called us to the truth, when his word got into us, that's when the struggle started. It's his work, not ours. That's the first point. So why say the angel's a man? Well, what method does God use in the wrestling that goes on for the whole of our life until the breaking of a new day? The breaking of the day is the coming of Christ and the kingdom. And that wrestling that God started will go on until the breaking of the new day. All right. What method does he use? Well, have you seen an angel? I haven't. Not that I'm aware of. But I've gone through a lot of different circumstances where the angel's been present but I've had to deal face to face with men and some of those men have been pretty ugly men whose characteristics are awful and I've had to wrestle with that situation. How about you? So God uses the everyday experiences of life to bring us through that wrestling process. So when you go to work, brethren, you have problems... That's part of the wrestling. All right. You're probably put there because the angel has arranged it. So you go through that problem. You know, so the angel's behind it, but you don't see him. God uses the circumstances of everyday life. That's why the angel's called a man here. He's teaching us that simple principle. So two things, two things are done in verse 24. And look what happens then in verse 25. And when he saw that he prevailed not, that is, the angel prevailed not against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh. 
And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So what, why would it be the thigh, you think, that he touches? Well, the thigh is said to be out of joint or dislocated. That's what the word means. Ever had a dislocated finger? Painful. What about a dislocated shoulder? Oh, very, very painful. What about a dislocated hip? All right. Can you imagine that? You know, the sciatic nerve crushed. Absolutely excruciating, agonising pain with a dislocated hip. So get a picture in your mind, brothers and sisters and young people. You've got to get a picture in your mind. I do this to make it real. Here's Jacob. He's put his family across. He's desperate to find an angel. All of a sudden an angel grabs him. And Jacob puts his arms around the angel and he's going to hang on. He's not going to let go. And he hangs on to him for several hours. And they're face to face like this. Right? Face to face like that. And he's not going to let him go. And look, look at the story, what it happens here. Verse 26, and he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he's weeping. We know that from Hosea 12. Jacob is weeping. And he said unto him, What's your name? So the angels, think about this. They're like this. Jacob's got his arms. He's crushing this angel against him. He's not going to let him go. The angel's face is here and he says, What's your name? He says, Jacob. Got a picture? Verse 28. Thy name shall be called no more Jacob but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. You know the name Israel means to prevail with God? But it actually means a bit more than that. I'm going to prove this to you. You've got to be very careful with it, extremely careful. This is not for immature minds, not for silly people. Okay? The name Israel, in its most accurate translation, means to prevail over God. That's what it means. Now, prevail with God gets close, but the name actually means to prevail over God. You want proof? Just hold your horses. We'll be in Hosea 12, verse 4, very shortly. Just hold your horses. Okay? But that's what that name means. Look what happens then. Because in verse 29, Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. So, here you've got the angel, he says to Jacob, what's your name? He says, Jacob, well your name's no longer Jacob, but Israel. You've prevailed over God. You've hung on to me the whole night and I can't get away. But he could have got away, couldn't he? He could have got away. The angel could have flicked Jacob off like a fly. He doesn't choose to do so. But what he does is he touches his thigh and it goes, wow, right angles. And here's a man, he's in such excruciating pain, you'd want to sort of take your hands off the angel, wouldn't you, and put it down to your hip and say, oh, that's awful. He will not let that angel go. I will not let you go until you bless me. And then he says to the angel, what's your name? And the angel says, mind your own business. Mind your own business. That's what he says to him at the end of verse 29. Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. You know what he's saying, saying to him? Jacob, I just changed your name. You ask me my name, that's, not an effect, that's nothing of any interest to you. This is not a relationship of equality, Jacob. I could have flicked you off and killed you in a moment. But I have not done that. I've put you through awful pain to see whether or not you would hang on through all that pain. Most of us go through something like that in life, don't we? A lot of pain and agony. And the simple answer, brothers and sisters, is to hang on. Despite the pain, you hang on until the breaking of the day. And the breaking of the day is not very far away. That's the great lesson of Jacob's life. But he names this place, as you're going to see, this... I don't know, it's in my notes. I'll, I'll, yeah, it is in my notes. Let's go down to it. So his name is changed to Israel, but not until Genesis 35, verse 21, when Rachel the Syrian had died. But look what happens here in verse 30. Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, 
for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved, he says. Now, pineal means I have seen God. It's in the first person singular. Because that's about Jacob's personal lesson. But what about the next verse? Verse 31. And as he passed over Penuel, it's a different word, isn't it? It's different to verse 30. Penuel. It's different because it's a different grammar. Whereas Penuel is in the first person singular, Penuel is in the third person plural. So whereas Penuel means, I have seen God, Jacob could say that, Penuel means, they have seen God. In other words, what happened here, brothers and sisters, is a lesson for us all. And that's what Hosea 12 tells us. Let's go, I know that the time is... You know, we've only got a couple of minutes to go, so bear with me. Let's go to Hosea chapter 12 and finish this off tonight. Because this is the exposition. This is Yahweh's own exposition of what we've been reading about in Genesis 32. So in Hosea 12 we read this. Verse 3. He took his brother by the heel in the womb and by his strength he had power with God. Now that word power there in verse 3 is the word sarah, S-A-R-A-H. It's one of the two Hebrew words that makes up the name Israel. Alright? And sarah means to prevail. Alright? Now let's, let's take that meaning. Thou hast power or prevailed with God. Verse 4. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. Now this is a different word. In the Hebrew, this word prevailed in verse 4 is the word yakol. It means to overcome. To overcome. Well, how did Jacob prevail over God? Well, we're told. He wept. He wept and made supplication unto him. All right, that's how he prevailed over God. Now, you reckon I got this right? You reckon I'm making this up? I know I see some face in the audience saying, oh, that guy out there, he's talking rubbish. No, I'm not. Okay? I'll show you I'm not talking rubbish. I want you to take your eyes back to the last verse of chapter 11 of Hosea. Just on the same page. Verse 12 of Hosea 11. God says this, Ephraim compasseth me about with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with God. Alright? Judah yet ruleth with God. Why did Judah rule with God? Well, you guess when Hosea was prophesying. Guess who was on the throne of Judah? when these words were written. A man called Hezekiah. Hezekiah. And Isaiah walked into Hezekiah and said, put your house in order, you're going to die. There's the declaration from God, it's unchangeable, you're going to die. And Isaiah turns on his heel and he walks out. He doesn't even get halfway across the courtyard and Yahweh says to him, go back. Why does he go back? Why does he get another 15 years of life? Well, because as soon as Isaiah left, Hezekiah turned to the wall. And he wept. He wept bitterly. And he prayed to his God. And he appealed to him. He made supplication. And Yahweh answered it. He changed his decree. You know what that's telling me? What that's telling me is this, brothers and sisters, that when God is dealing with a faithful man and woman, you know, an upright sort of person like Jacob, he cannot resist their weeping and their supplication. It is impossible for him to resist. You and I can. You can come and bow down to my feet and weep your heart out, but I can be hard-hearted and not listen to your appeals. It is impossible for our God not to answer that kind of supplication. That is the only way that men can prevail over God, by weeping 
and supplication. I told you this wasn't for children. It's not for immature people. It's for people who, like Hezekiah, come to a crisis in life, like Jacob who come to a crisis in life, who abandon their own attempts to save themselves out of their predicaments and turn to the only source that can help and God will not fail them. He will not fail them if it is in accordance with his purpose. He found him in Bethel, we read here in Hosea 12 verse 6. At the end of verse 4, he found him in Bethel and there he spake with us. This is a reference to his second visit to Bethel, by the way, when he was free of the Syrian. There he spake with us means it's a lesson for us. Verse 6 concludes it. It says, Therefore turn thou to thy God, keep mercy and judgment, which are the characteristics of our God, and wait on thy God continually. Therefore by thy God shalt thou return, says Brother Ham. Get the idea of this? And thou through thy God that's turned. The RSV. So you by the help of thy God return. It's God's work in our life that he's talking about. But we've got to do something. We've got to do something actually. When it says to him in verse 6, you see that word? End of the verse. And wait on thy God continually. You know what that word is? It's the Hebrew word kovah, Q-A-V-A-H. It means to bind together by twisting. And the imagery you get is of an angel and Jacob bound together, twisted together for hours, with Jacob hanging on for dear life until the breaking of the day. What a lesson that is, brothers and sisters, for you and me. This is how God deals with the Jacob in all of us.